My name is Don Patton. Uh, I'm one of the people involved in the World War II History Roundtable and in the uh, organization of this program. And I want to uh, sp pay special thanks to the people of the World War II Roundtable that are here today, but to the Minnesota chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League who have been so instrumental in putting this together and to the Minnesota Historical Society. The origins of this program started last October. Uh, the Roundtable did a program on the 75th anniversary of the torch landings in North Africa. We had a historian from San Diego, uh, Vince O'Hara, and he told us about this wonderful uh, museum that sits in the harbor at San Diego. And shortly after that, uh, I was made aware that uh, our historian speaker today is, um, had done a book on the, uh, the 442nd uh, in, uh, in France. And then I talked to Bud Nakasone, who I have such deep affection for, and we served together in the military. But uh, Bud says, hey, you know, we still have some of those guys here in the Twin Cities that were involved in that engagement. So uh, several things came together and uh, today has materialized. I also want to pay uh, a special thanks to uh, Cheryl Dulas for her, uh, uh, the, pro the, uh, the uh, uh, publicity that she's done with this to give a warm welcome from the uh, Japanese American Citizens League is Carolyn Nakabasut. Oh. Hi, I'm Carolyn Nakamatsu, and I'm the uh, chair of the education committee for the uh, Twin Cities Japanese American Citizens League, and I want to welcome you here today. I want to say that your, this program is probably the last program in a series of programs that we have had in the last five years, and especially this summer. The Go For Broke organization, which is the slogan for uh, the 442nd and 100th, we sponsored an exhibit called Courage and Compassion. And when you leave today, we'll have a reception next door, and we will have some of the, um, the, the charts and the panels that we designed for that exhibit. And that will talk about, uh, we emphasize the military the Japanese language military intelligence school because this is the site where 6,000 uh, Japanese Americans came through to get their training to um, go to the Pacific. I do encourage you after the end of this program to go next door and look at the, um, the panels that we have. Thank you again and welcome. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, we'll, we'll move right into our program with Scott McGaw. Scott is the uh, marketing manager for the USS Midway, as I mentioned, it's based in uh, the harbor at San Diego. And if you go to San Diego, be sure and go see him. It's a, truly a privilege, and, and I echo Don's thanks uh, to all of you, the organizations. Uh, Don's hospitality has been just extraordinary. Uh, the short time I've been, a, been aboard, uh, been here uh, in Minneapolis, and I really look forward to sharing uh, this remarkable legacy that truly is, I think, unique in the American mosaic, if you will, uh, of, of America. When I started researching the book, the 442nd, uh, the rescue mission in the Vosges, it became very clear that it, it's a bigger story than just a week. Uh, that literally took place this week, 74 years ago, when you think about it, uh, the end of October 1944. Um, and I think about the headlines in today's newspaper, newspapers and, and radio and TV about the polarization and immigration and ethnic groups and not to get into any kind of politics or whatever. But for those who aren't aware, um, these headlines aren't very new, unfortunately, in, in many ways. Republican or Democrat is, isn't the point. Uh, in my home state, I was born in San Diego. In my home state in 1905, uh, San Francisco decided Japanese-American citizen children needed to go to a separate school. 
literally, uh, and it was overwhelmingly supported by voters. In, 19, in the 1920s, California enacted, enacted legislation that Japanese American citizens could not own real estate in California. Uh, they lost their real estate uh, for a, a variety of reasons. In the 1920s, 1930s, laws were enacted that if you were a Japanese American working in California and you had your spouse, uh, your children in Japan, they could not come join you. They, were, they were, had to stay in Japan. At the time, there were J uh, Japanese children and spouses in immigration centers, detention centers, on their way to join dad as a farmer or whoever it might be. They were sent back to Japan. A little eerie little history tending to repeat itself with, again without getting into politics. But that was the backdrop. Uh, and yet by 1940, there were 127,000 uh, Japanese Americans in this country, primarily on the West Coast. And then Pearl Harbor. I hardly need to explain to you what Pearl Harbor meant uh, to this country in a variety of different ways and some of the reactions that, that took place. The quote you are reading there uh, was in an editorial in the Seattle Times, or a Seattle newspaper. Uh, it was not an isolated voice, obviously. Uh, speeches on the floors of Congress, uh, rallies, placards, flyers. Uh, it was an ugly time in a lot of different ways to the point that pretty, pretty quickly we got this kind of an attitude uh, when FDR signed the order uh, in February of 1942 to create the internment camps. The order 9066 obviously created the internment camps, 10 of them from California to Arkansas. Uh, there are different numbers when you do the research where the 100,000 relocated, 110,000, I've seen numbers as high, War Relocation Authority, 120,000. It's hard to imagine that many people being told in a few weeks to pack up, uh, uh, back up in a suitcase and leave. That's Rochester, Minnesota. Imagine Rochester, Minnesota in 90 days being empty. Every family, every teacher, every business owner, every kid, every school class, everyone. Hospitals, gone. Two months notice, one month notice. That's the equivalent of what took place uh, in the aftermath of, of uh, Pearl Harbor. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the internment camp story, what they were like. Uh, There's a lot of conversations at the time where they, uh, were these American citizens incarcerated. The federal government wanted to call it evacuation uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, FBI arrested 1,212 Japanese Americans on the West Coast within two days of Pearl Harbor. Uh, virtually none of them were uh, in custody a month later. There was no reason to arrest them, but the hysteria led to the internment camps. Uh, and it was tough conditions. Don't let the PR campaigns of the federal government uh, say otherwise. Uh, schools did not have enough books. Uh, you could not do homework in the internment camps for a couple of years. You had to leave the books in the schools. Uh, many of the oral histories talk about uh, the hospitals were a place to be avoided, uh, chronic shortages of medical personnel as well as supplies, uh, how Japanese American families and, and so on uh, accepted that is just mind boggling to me, uh, leaving Japan towns primarily on the west coast abandoned. Um, I can't imagine what that must have been like in many different contexts. Uh, Two-thirds of those uh, who were incarcerated or, or sent to the internment camps never came back uh, to the Japan towns or the communities where they were living on the West Coast. San Diego's Japan town disappeared. It's not there today. And it was a very vibrant community, a big part of the San Diego community back in the 20s and the 1930s. Uh, but it literally disappeared. And it was against this backdrop uh, in 1942 or, or thereabouts 1942, during the Battle of Midway, in fact, somewhat ironically, is when the 298th and the 299th uh, National Guard battalions uh, in Hawaii uh, were sent to the U.S. Um, they had been activated. They would become the 100th Battalion. As you well know, the equivalent of the 1st Battalion of the 442nd when it was created. Um, they shipped out uh, to Camp McCoy and then on to Shelby, uh, Camp Shelby uh, in Mississippi. I can't imagine a more foreign environment or alien environment uh, to these young men who had been primarily drafted uh, before the war, um, living in Honolulu and Hawaii and ending up in, in Mississippi. By the summer of 1942, the military intelligence service obviously had already been established. Language schools were being established literally a month before Pearl Harbor. Uh, the first one was in San Francisco, about three weeks before the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, in a San Francisco hangar, the budget was $2,000. Following Pearl Harbor, things changed dramatically. In June of 1942, during the internment camp era, uh, the, school was, was, the language schools were created. 
You know the story here locally. Other groups that I've spoken to don't in terms of Camp Savage, 200 students, 18 instructors. Uh, they arrived here in three different trains uh, in secret. Uh, there was a significant security concerns about those young men getting here. Uh, so the government took extraordinary efforts, uh, action, to make sure they did get here. And of course, two years later, they would end up at Fort Snelling. We jump ahead a little bit to February of 1943. It's ironic to me, only a, a year to the month after uh, creating internment camps, FDR signs in order to create the 442nd. I don't know if you all can read that uh, quote. Uh, it's a little bit small on the screen. In his statement, he said, Americanism is not and never will be, or never was, a matter of race and ancestry. Well, what about the internment camps? I don't, don't quite get how... You could justify one but not the other, but that's the way it was in those days. Um, they needed between four and 5,000 uh, volunteers to create the 442nd. It was at a time during the war when the outcome was very uncertain. Uh, they were raising divisions and, and regiments all over the country, uh, so this was not a unique situation by any, stre by any uh, stretch of the imagination. FDR uh, overruled uh, Secretary of War Stimson. Uh, who did not want to create a 442nd. He didn't believe Japanese Americans born in San Diego or San Francisco or Seattle could be trusted. Uh, General Marshall did. Uh, so the order was uh, uh, created. The Pentagon was overwhelmed by the response. 10,000 young men volunteered from Hawaii. 1,500 volunteered from behind barbed wire in the internment camps. I, I just, as a father, I can't imagine a 20-year-old who's been rounded up with his family and sent to Tule Lake or Utah or Wyoming, volunteering to uh, serve and perhaps die for a country who had rounded up and incarcerated, in a sense, his family uh, indefinitely you know, for all they knew at that point. But nonetheless, they did. Uh, ultimately, the 442nd, as you know, was created. Uh, the 100th uh, had already been created from those two Hawaiian battalion, Hawaiian National Guard units. Uh, the, Hawaiian, the 100th would, of course, precede the rest of the 442nd, the 2nd Battalion, and the 3rd Battalion into battle. And by now, uh, at the time this was created, the 2nd class from the language school had already graduated. Uh, it was just about this time. So Japanese Americans were already serving in combat in the Pacific while this debate was going on and the 442nd was being created. Who were these young men? Uh, uh, Jim Okubu. Uh, Jimmy Kanaya, uh, Barney Hahiro, uh, Ed Ichiyama, George Sakato. They were plantation workers. Um, they were college students. Their average IQ nearly qualified for officer candidate school. Uh, a third of them were college graduates. Um, three and four families from a, a single family volunteered. Uh, many of them had just graduated high school. They were working part-time summer jobs in bowling alleys and butcher shops and uh, grocery stores. Uh, and yet they were willing to raise their hand and volunteer uh, for combat and potentially die uh, for their country. They all found their way to Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Uh, that had been uh, erected hastily, strictly for the 442nd. It was nowhere near the standards of the training camps in San Diego at Pendleton, MCRD, and elsewhere uh, during World War II. Uh, these young men had to adjust from a diet of rice to beef tongue, uh, they went on four and five mile hikes through, uh, training hikes through the swamps, carrying 75 pounds of gear, 200 rounds of ammunition. They didn't have uniforms that fit them. Uh, the Army finally realized they needed to requisition women's uniforms to fit the stature, the physical stature of these young men, so they could at least wear decent clothes uh, as they trained. Some of them were taken to the Carolinas uh, in an experiment. Uh, American officers thought that perhaps dogs could be trained to learn the unique smell of the Japanese. And wouldn't it be useful then to have dog units, canine units, in the islands in the Pacific searching out the enemy if Japanese really smelled different than the rest of us folks? Uh, didn't work. Uh, it failed. Uh, about, I think it was six or seven weeks later, uh, those young men came back from the Carolinas, rejoined the 100th, uh, and that experiment didn't go any farther than that. Of course, these men all uh, volunteered for a racist, segregated army. They knew that they would not be commanded by uh, Japanese Americans, that it would only be by white officers. But they became a, sep a secret weapon for the 442nd. And it's, a, it's an aspect that few people have really talked a whole lot about. The commanding officers of the 100th, the 2nd, and the 3rd, uh, Gordon Singles, Alfred Persall, uh, James Manley, they became the fiercest advocates, and not protectors, but advocates 
of these Japanese American soldiers. They became so impressed with their devotion to duty, dedication, honor, before glory, and so on. Uh, some of the stories that then developed in battle uh, with, with other, their commanding officers and generals uh, created a backdrop that makes the, the accomplishments of the 442nd all the more remarkable. We're going to spend just a couple minutes here, no more than that, because there's a, a number of things that take place. And I tried to con consolidate it into a sing single map. It was in September of 1943 that the 100th went ashore, I think down near the bottom, if I recall correctly. Um, a big experiment again, attached to the uh, 34th Red Bull uh, Division. Within a few weeks, there were newsreels back in the American theaters talking about these sinewy soldiers and their devotion to duty, their heroism. They were earning stars within a week combat in combat, of being in combat in Italy. Um, they quickly began to develop a sense of resentment, feeling that oftentimes they were sent on the most dangerous missions, the most risky near-suicide missions, and yet they caught the attention of senior officers, uh, the information service, and so on, uh, that really began to build the legacy of what became the 442nd. The 100th ultimately got through, uh, made the, the dangerous river crossings, got the casino uh, in early 1944. And then as you can see on the map, shortly thereafter, the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 442nd uh, got to Italy, uh, also attached to the 34th. Uh, and together they were all as part of one unit on the dash uh, to liberate Rome. Uh, that was really the first major uh, accomplishment, if you will, in combat of the 442nd. Um, and that took place uh, in the middle of June, 1944. It was about this time that things took a different twist. Uh, the 100th and the 2nd and the 3rd Battalions were in reserve. The 36th Battalion, 36th Division, along with others, were pulled out of Italy uh, and sent to Operation Dragoon, uh, the, the amphibious landing in southern France. And that's where that arrow is on the left-hand side, and that's where we're really going to spend a bit more time. It was an overwhelming route. Uh, the invasion of France uh, in the South. The Germans were unprepared. Even though they knew it was coming, they had cracked the American codes long before, months before, uh, but they just didn't have the manpower at that time in 1944 to repel the, the landings uh, um, in, in Marseille and, and Nice and so on. And the advance up through France exceeded all expectations. The tip of that arrow on the left is the Vosges Mountains, uh, the doorstep to Germany in, in eastern France, literally five miles uh, from the German border. Um, the 36th Division and others were able to push the German army back that far, capturing literally hundreds of thousands of German soldiers, cutting off entire armies of the Germans in western France, and they became prisoners. But that really began to set the backdrop uh, for what took place in the, on the rescue mission. I don't want to leave Italy um, without touching a little bit on the collective legacy of, of not just the 100th, but the 2nd and 3rd Battalions of the 442nd um, during the, the first Italian campaign. The 100th uh, arrived in Italy with 1,300 men. It left with 600 a couple months later, uh, a few months later. The 100th earned 900 Purple Hearts while accomplishing every single mission, taking every single hill, taking every single town, day after day after day. It is there that the 100th became known as the Purple Heart Battalion. Uh, it became known so quickly that those newsreels I was telling you about in the theaters back home were, were, was focusing on that. And it was there that some of the resentment began to build in terms of the kinds of assignments they were assigned, uh, given, and that would be something that would become a major player during the rescue mission in the Vosges. Forgive me, another map that's got a couple different dimensions to it, but rather than bore you with a whole bunch of component maps, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what this one is all about. Um, as I said, the 36th Division and others had pushed the Germans up into the Vosges River, up into the Vosges Mountains. Uh, the 42nd came along in early September, was able to proceed relatively quickly uh, into the foothills of the Vosges. Uh, that would be just to the left of, of this particular map. Uh, and you can, if you can read that, Beaumont there on the left-hand side became the staging area uh, to go into the, into the Vosges, uh, where it became the, the true nightmare. Um, no army had ever penetrated through the Vosges against a dug-in army since the days of Caesar. That's how rugged that terrain is, and you're about to see some photos of it. it, it, it and I was fortunate to spend a week uh, in the Vosges and, and walk that six-mile trail, and it's, it's amazing uh, when you think about what these men endured. The big black line down the middle, 
Now, that's where on October 24th, the first uh, battalion of 141st of the 36th, uh, led by a lieutenant, Marty Higgins, went out on patrol uh, on a single logging road along a, a brutal, uh, heavily forested ridge. That black line extends from left to right about six miles. They were able to get that far uh, in one day, much to their surprise. I was fortunate to interview a number of the members of that 1st Battalion, 275 men. They found all kinds of, of littered, uh, litter, German litter along the logging trails, leading them to believe that they had retreated and given up that ground. They had not. Uh, what actually happened was they let that 1st uh, Battalion, 141st, continue farther than they expected to, got out six miles almost to the end of that ridge, that arrow extending all the way to the right, then they closed in behind them. 275 men within a few hours were trapped, six miles in front of friendly lines, uh, carrying one day's worth of supplies. They expected to go maybe two or three miles, stop, get resupplied during the night, and continue on. They overextended themselves, lots of reasons why, and debate, and so on, which really isn't the point here, but nonetheless, that's what happened. Uh, October 25th, uh, we're getting close to today's date, aren't we? Um, the 36th Division sent more division battalions from the 141st trying to reach the, what became known as the Lost Battalion. They failed. They didn't get very far at all. They only got a few hundred yards because the Germans had closed in all five miles along a single logging road uh, and got nowhere. October 26th, what's today? today today's the 26th, uh, right? 27th, almost. Um, October 26th, yesterday, 74 years ago yesterday, the 442nd was called up. They had just completed two weeks of combat around Beaumont and Bruyere, uh, just at the foothills uh, of the Vosges. Uh, they were exhausted. They were undermanned. They were undersupplied. They were led to believe they would have at least five days of R&R &R and resupply and replacements. Uh, because of the casualties, they were given 24 hours. Um, why other divisions, and there were multiple divisions, I'll say it, Caucasian divisions, in the area right next to them. Why they weren't called forward, no one knows. Uh, reading the after action reports, the memoirs and so on of the commanding general, uh, no one really could explain why it was the 442nd. Some be people believed it was, we're cannon fodder. Other people will make the argument, we're so good, we were so accomplished in what we were, uh, were able to achieve in, in Italy, they, they called forward the very best they had and that was us. Hard to argue. That's the logging road. Uh, again, I had the opportunity to be there for almost a week uh, with a guide, spent about three and a half, four days on that trail. Uh, that is it's exactly the way it is today. This was, I don't know, two or three Julys ago. Uh, from there, it drops off very steeply on both sides of the logging trail. Um, uh, very heavily forested, slopes of up to 45 degrees. And remember, we're at the, at, at, at the edge of winter, uh, very heavy rains, uh, edge of snow. It didn't look like this. This is July. This is when you're still picking blueberries uh, in, the, in, in the arroyos and, and so on. What they didn't know was that there were 400 Germans dug in between, 700 Germans dug in between their position and Lieutenant Higgins and the Lost Battalion six miles away. They also did not know that 2,000 reinfor German reinforcement troops were on their way coming in from Strasbourg on the back side uh, to come up uh, to reinforce. The clock was ticking, and they had no way of knowing that uh, as they headed out on that uh, ridge along that logging road. That's the train. That's what I walked on in on um, 74 years later. Think back to the photo you saw just a moment ago about how lush and, well, and, and dense the forest is. That was taken during the battle. Uh, it's really a testament as much as anything to the, the intensity of the artillery that these Japanese Americans endured, stripping the trees into giant toothpicks, if you will. I need a better word than toothpick. Uh, but nonetheless, the very few photos of the actual combat uh, along that ridge, it's, they're so striking as to how naked the forest is compared to what the, the forest really is uh, during, during normal times. Um, the other thing that struck me when I was on, on that trail, um, is how dense the forest is. If any of you are, are deer hunters, generally don't want to hunt uh, where you can't see more than 20, 30 feet in front of you. There's another tree, another tree, another tree, another tree. You know, as far as the eye can see, and, and then some. That's what that forest was, was like. Very densely 
uh, forested. Although this photo is a little bit misleading, it gives you, begins to give you a sense of the terrain at least, if nothing else, that these young men um, uh, endured. And they were fighting at the edge of, or at the beginning of one of the coldest winters on record. Uh, they don't normally see snow the 27th of October or the 26th of October. They were already getting snow at that time. And it was constantly raining, kind of like what I've seen in Minneapolis the last 24 hours. <laughs> Fog, rain, I haven't seen the snow yet, knock on wood. Uh, again, one of the coldest um, winters uh, on record. They did not have winter gear. Maybe coincidentally, the 442nd was one of the last combat regiments under the 36th in the 36th Division to receive winter clothing. It arrived two weeks after this rescue mission. Go figure. That's again the kind of terrain um, that we're talking about. You read the after action reports, they're losing men by the dozens every single day. The after action reports talk about uh, you know, 57 casualties. We, we advanced 300 yards today, literally measured in football fields. And, these young, and the, uh, for the lost battalion is six miles away, maybe five miles away, maybe four and a half miles away as they went day after day. Tanks were useless. The 442nd had eight available to it. Um, they bogged down in the mud. The other reason that they became useless was the Germans knew exactly where these Japanese Americans were coming. This was the only road. This was the only route. The Germans had been there for years occupying this part of France. All their artillery, two and three miles away, had already been zeroed in exactly on this logging road, plus 100 yards on one side, minus 100 yards on the other. Uh, I didn't get into the previous map too much, but that big black arrow where the 141st uh, pro pro progressed, the other lighter arrows represented the three battalions, the 100th, 2nd, and 3rd on either side of that logging road, basically taking the same route. The Germans knew this uh, hands down. So literally within 24 hours, all eight tanks uh, were out of commission, American tanks. Uh, they weren't getting anywhere anyway because of the mud and the slope uh, and, and so on. Uh, a big part of the battle was what was taking place at night, which they don't make movies about. Uh, they had to build sawmills. The only way even the soldiers and, and jeeps to carry the wounded could advance uh, at, at night to bring either supplies forward or the wounded back uh, uh, to aid stations was to build corduroy roads. And a corduroy road is literally, you cut down a tree, uh, stump, a, a log, you create a log, you lay it down crosswise in the road. Cut down another tree, right, lay it next to it. Two trees, you've gained eight, eight, 12 inches. And you just keep doing it, thousands and thousands of trees building what was called a corduroy road. It was the only way you could advance in this kind of, of, of habitat. Uh, again, beyond description. That's a German machine gun emplacement. That's what they were trying to find through the snow, through the rain, uh, through the mud. Um, this is now, this uh, photo was taken approximately on October 27th. There's our anniversary date. Um, the, the Marty Higgins and the Lost Battalion had run out of supplies. They had been trapped for three days. Uh, the American Army was trying to bomb the Lost Battalion with auxiliary tanks filled with food. Uh, because of the weather, they weren't able to hit on target, so they were resupplying the Germans. Uh, they had no water. Uh, there was a muddy bog that's still there about 200 yards away. The Germans had that secured. Uh, and there was a story at one point that the Germans had left one of their dead in the water to make it undrinkable. Uh, uh, the battery uh, on the single radio the Lost Battalion had had just about gone dead. Medical supplies for the wounded, forget it. Uh, so it was getting dire, more dire and more dire while the 442nd was facing this. Real quickly, let me share with you what it looks like today. These, these are gone, but they're foxholes where they would dig in every single night. And the guy that explained to me, and I could see it very quickly, all the German foxholes were shaped in an oval. All the American foxholes were shaped in a circle. So you could say, that's a German foxhole. That's an American, you know, 25 feet apart, that's an American foxhole. The German foxholes were shaped in an oval because again, the Germans know exactly where the 442nd was gonna be coming from. So they could aim everything in one direction and one direction only. They didn't have to worry about flanking or anything, by and large. Whereas the Americans, they were surrounded as well, the 442nd, by defending troops. So they had to build it in, in a circular shape so they could try to guard and have somebody stay awake all night long because they didn't know where the enemy fire might be coming from. So that's an example of a machine gun nest that was probably built three months in advance 
knowing exactly where the enemy, ultimately the Americans, were going to be coming uh, when the time came. Um, I've written a book on military medicine for a variety of reasons, and so I have an, a special appreciation for this. This hollow in the ground is still there. I was there in July in record heat. It was still damp, dank, and dark. Uh, and that was, one of the, that was a typical aid station. Uh, some of the oral histories I've read and, and some of the interviews, the medics of the 442nd grew incredibly frustrated uh, when it would come, came time to pull a piece of shrapnel out of a kid's chest and the rain and needles from the pine trees are raining down literally into the chest wound uh, when they're trying to save lives. For those who haven't seen it, and I, I'll show it to you later at the reception, this is a piece of shrapnel. I picked it up off the forest floor there. Um, all I've done is brush the oxide off, but when you look at this, you know, a, piece, a mortar shell that explodes into pieces you know, on detonation, the razor sharpness of these, and shrapnel typically will hit you at about 100 miles an hour, spinning beyond belief. It would be the sound of like a, a bee coming at you in a split second and tearing your chest open. That's what shrapnel really looks like, that most of us don't get a chance to see or hold in our hands. And of course, they come in far bigger pieces than this as well. Um, to give you a sense of what these medics, people like uh, Jim Okubo, were dealing with, during the entire week, the 442nd lost a man every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day. Just mounted time, uh, just every 30 minutes, here comes someone else back. And they would try to move them out then during the night, if they could, back to uh, farther back, because they knew more were coming in almost around the, around the clock. Quick update, four days of battle, October 28th, and that's how far they've come. They've still got two miles to go. Uh, and they're now critically short of, of reinforcements, of replacements. They weren't able to get most of the replacements up during the night. Uh, more than, like I say, more than a mile away. Uh, bombing, uh, Amer allied bombing, so to speak, of supplies to the, fort, to the lost battalion at the end of the ridge was proving unsuccessful. Uh, it was just a, a critical situation that was about to be made incredibly worse. There was a near mutiny during this, this uh, rescue mission. Um, 36th was commanded by Lieutenant General John Dahlquist. He was almost fired during Operation Dragoon because he disappeared uh, during the landing on the southern beaches uh, of France. He decided to go ashore without a radio. You know, the most idiotic thing you can possibly imagine. And his boss, uh, General Truscott, almost fired him on the spot. He was a personnel man, had never seen combat. Uh, 30 years in the Navy or in the Army at that point or thereabouts. Uh, he was insecure. He micromanaged. He was literally scared uh, of combat. Uh, as panic began to develop in his headquarters and him by the 28th, he was going up to the front lines and countermanding platoon leader orders, uh, squad orders, um, uh, 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 battalion orders you know, by singles and manly and, and personal. Uh, it got to be just so brutal that literally Dahlquist on the air, on radio, would call his commanding officers of the 100th and 2nd and 3rd liars. When they would report back the situation, and it wasn't jiving with what Dahlquist wanted or, or thought he knew, he literally called them liars on the air that everyone near radio could hear. Uh, you just don't do that. You just don't do that when you're still a mile and a half away from, from, from rescue. Literally, um, Alfred Persall, the, the 3rd Battalion um, uh, commander, when Dahlquist came up to the front lines, they got in an argument and, and Persall risked his career. He literally pushed Dahlquist back to his Jeep and ordered him to the back line and said, don't you ever come forward again. That's insubordination. I mean, you can be court-martialed in a split second. Uh, the man on the left is Gordon Singles. He was commanding officer of the 100th Battalion. He also harbored a similar hatred for Dahlquist and how Dahlquist was basically screwing things up. He would refuse to take the radio, uh, pick up the receiver, when his radio man said Dahlquist was on the phone. Again, risking the end of his career and immediate court martial. It was that bad in terms of Dahlquist's leadership and the fierce loyalty of these three Caucasian lieutenant colonels uh, who felt that their, their men were being treated so unfairly, uh, being asked to, the, the most impossible um, uh, missions and yet the end was not in sight as far as they knew on this particular mission. This is how they slept at night. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier, they're called split, uh, slit trenches. I can't imagine fighting all day and then taking an hour right before dark, which is about 4 p.m. in France, in the mountains, uh, in winter, in October, and using your helmet or maybe a shovel to dig down 12 or 14 inches and try to sleep in the mud. 
and the pooling water. The reason why they got down, it wasn't so much for the enemy because of enemy machine gun fire or whatever, it was because of wooden daggers called tree bursts. The, again, the German artillery knew exactly where these guys were. They would shoot artillery that was designed to explode 50, 75, 100 feet up above ground and literally destroy, obliterate the trees, sending hundreds of dag wooden daggers down to the ground. And that's what would kill them, not the shrapnel necessarily from the artillery itself. They talked about, the, the, uh, in the oral histories, of it sounding like a swarm of bees coming in a split second after an explosion 75 feet over your head of hundreds of daggers coming straight down. Um, remember, these guys are all 20, 21, 22 years of age. October 30th, everybody was exhausted. Uh, command did not know how many uh, members of the Lost Battalion were still around, uh, were still alive, uh, much less combat capable. Uh, a Japanese-American soldier by the name of Matsukumoto uh, uh, drew the short straw. It was his turn to be in the, the lead squad of the lead, um, what am I trying to say, lead unit uh, as they were advancing. That's not where you wanted to be when the Germans knew exactly where you were coming and they are just waiting for you. He looked down on the ground and saw a piece of wire. And a lot of you have seen in movies and so on the radio communications and boxes. The, the commanding officer, the lieutenant, picks up a radio or, or a, a head handset, and it's a, there's a wire that's been strung out from um, through the forest back to battalion command or whatever. This is what the wire looks like. This was sitting on the ground when I was walking through, uh, not far from where the lost battalion was. Mutt saw this, and, they, and the theory was that maybe this is a wire that the lost battalion had strung out as it was advancing back to its command uh, combat post before they, got, they were surrounded and, and entrapped. So they started following this wire. Um, expecting to be fired upon at any time. They, had not, they were not fired that morning. It turned out that the Germans had begun pulling back that night before. No one knew that. That the, the 442nd had taken uh, such a toll on those defenders that they were beginning to pull back and the lost battalion wasn't quite in the danger it had been only 24 hours earlier. But of course, Mutt and the gang didn't know that. Uh, finally, uh, one of the lookouts from the lost battalion spotted Mutt. They cautiously recognized each other's uh, uniforms. They came forward. Uh, the big magnanimous line, uh, the first sentence that's spoken between them, Mutt looks up at this tall guy by the name of Eason Bond, uh, who I interviewed later in Georgia, uh, and he asked, do you want a cigarette? Uh, and Eason said, yes, I'll take all you've got. Uh, they had not, you know, uh, didn't have any cigarettes for, for days. Uh, with that, the Lost Battalion had been rescued. The rest of the 442nd came forward. Um, 275 had been trapped. Uh, 211 were left. Uh, but in about six days of heavy combat um, by the time the, the rescue took place. The next day, photo time, uh, time to send some photos back uh, for the stars and stripes and the newspapers and the newsreels. That was a photo taken. That's Marty Higgins on the left. All the other men in that photo, almost, are Signal Corps, uh, the communications guys. No Japanese Americans, none of the 442nd. They were told, don't stay where the Lost Battalion, you just rescued them yesterday. Keep going the last mile to the end of the ridge where the Lost Battalion was supposed to get to. They kept fighting, undermanned, undersupplied. Uh, they were not taken back off the line for r, &R right away. Certainly the, the Lost Battalion was, they were taken down the next day, uh, but the 442nd continued. A quick overview. In the aftermath of the Vosges campaign, in six weeks, the 442nd suffered 1,400 casualties. They lost 350 men to rescue 211. Every Medal of Honor nomination, there were I believe seven uh, during this rescue mission, were all down, downgraded to silver stars or distinguished uh, crosses, service crosses uh, with no explanation. Uh, that happened time and time again for the Japanese Americans. And yet when they came home, they came home to a mixed reaction. Uh, the military officers to a man, all the way up to the commander in chief, uh, Truman, uh, praised them up one side and down the other and said, we take you into battle any time, any place, anywhere in the world. The rest of America, not so much. There were stories in the newspapers about uh, hero, Japanese-American heroes being refused service in diners, being refused haircuts. Mount Hood, uh, Oregon, erected a monument, I think it was American Legion, of all the young men who served for Mount Hood uh, area uh, in World War II, except the Japanese-Americans. Those kids' names were not included. Now, in fairness, another civic group in Mount Hood said that's a crock, built a, a monument with all the names. But that kind of mixed reaction was very much uh, in, in place um, 
uh, when they came home. A quick snapshot of what they earned. You don't win these medals, you earn them, you receive them in the most difficult way possible. Uh, the 442nd became the most decorated uh, combat unit of its size in all of World War II, out of 16 million Americans who served in so many different capacities. They suffered a 300% casualty rate. It took a while before this nation, in my opinion, really became, began to reconcile its treatment of the Japanese Americans, whether it's the internment camps or perhaps in, in the military as well. It really didn't happen until the 1980s. You know, as you can read here, and some of you will probably recall some of this, the conversation began with President Reagan um, uh, with the rep reparations bill uh, that provided something of a cash payment as well as an education fund. Um, 21 medals of honors were finally awarded. They were upgraded from lower medals. Uh, when the ceremony was held in the White House by, with President uh, Clinton, of those 21, only seven were still alive. Widows and sons and daughters and nieces and nephews were all that were left, so to speak, uh, to receive uh, the Medal of Honor that many people will argue should have been awarded in 1945, 1946, uh, along with the others. One of the poignant things I realized not too long ago that all three commanding officers of the three battalions, the 100, 2nd, and 3rd, Manley, Persall, and Singles, did not live to see the White House ceremony. They all died in the, in the 1990s. I, I feel badly about that when I, when I realized that. Not too long after that, Congress decided to award every surviving uh, Japanese American who served uh, a Congressional Gold Medal, the highest honor that Congress can award. Only 5,000 of the 33,000 Japanese Americans who served in World War II were still alive. Many of them could not travel, as you can imagine, being in their 80s and 90s. So these award ceremonies were held in gymnasiums and rotary clubs and town halls all over the country where the Pentagon, uh, the military, went to these uh, brave men you know, 50, 60 years later uh, to acknowledge uh, just what they, their legacy and what it has meant. I think this is a great quote. Uh, it's from Marty Higgins. I, I'm not sure if I could have done what you did to volunteer and fight for the country that took away your constitutional rights. In my lifetime, no other group was ever persecuted as badly as you were. Every one of you deserved the Distinguished Service Award. This was uh, spoken by Marty Higgins, that lieutenant in charge of those 275, dwindling down to 211. And he, would, he told that to a group of 442nd, primarily 100th Battalion men, because it was about that time, 55 years later, that a lot of these veterans began opening up and reunions began to be held that were inconceivable maybe 10 or 20 years after the war and who am I to judge why it would take some time for scars to heal and wounds to heal and it became a tradition, especially with the 100th, that those surviving members of the Lost Battalion would go to Hawaii as a special guest and in a, not in a sense of reconciliation but just a sense of reunion and sharing uh, and, and so on. Um, many of them uh, it wasn't Marty Higgins, but one of the commanding officers, again, Gordon Singles, came across Dahlquist uh, in Fort Bragg 20 years after the war at a ceremony, and Dahlquist extended his hand. Gordon Singles refused to take it. He was still active duty, another insubord act of insubordination. Instead, he snapped to his best uh, at, a, at attention uh, stance, a uh, good sharp salute, and kept his hand on his, at his forehead as Dahlquist extended his. So he didn't violate regulations, but he made it very clear to hundreds of people around him that he still felt uh, horribly offended by the way that Dahlquist had treated, in his view, of the Japanese Americans. More reunions. Uh, that's Erwin Blonder, the radio man, um, who began sharing his stories in the 1990s and, and 2000s. The reason why I wrote the book largely is because of the Go For Broke National Education Association in Los Angeles. They've been collecting oral histories for years and they've told me, and many of the hundreds of them have never been heard before. They're not published yet or online. And, and they told me that the archivist told me, many of them only began to be recorded about 2005, fairly recently, uh, that people were beginning to, men were beginning to open up, uh, whether it was uh, members of the 100th or the 2nd, anywhere in the 442nd, or those who were rescued. And it was about that time that they began meeting together once, you know, once a year as a reunion thing and began sharing. And I have to tell you, if you ever had the chance to hear any of these oral stories, oral histories, either video, some of them are videotaped, they are gut-wrenching. You know, a man 89 years old talking about what happened 50 years earlier and not being able, breaking down four or five times and the camera goes off and comes back on and he apologizes and continues on and so on. It's, it's just gut-wrenching what these people went through. And it makes me admire them all the more that they came home and became 
butchers and carpenters and uh, Barney Hahiro, who ultimately finally got his battle Medal of Honor, became a uh, security guard at an airport. And Jim Okubo, the medic, uh, became a dentist uh, after going to the University of Detroit and becoming a professor of dentistry at the University of Detroit being, before being killed in an automobile accident in 1967, leaving his wife and four children. And it was his wife who picked up his Medal of Honor 30 or 40 years later. Uh, so sad in, in those, those contexts, but because of this collection of oral histories, just in the last 15 years or so, books like Honor Before Glory and others are even remotely possible. Are we done with it all? I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide. Um, Jap Road in Texas. It took 12 years uh, for a group of locals uh, in that, I've forgotten the name of the town, um, in that town to convince the county that that's probably not an appropriate term anymore. In fairness, it was named for a Japanese rice farmer back in the 40s or whatever who lived at the end, 50s, who lived at the end of that road, but times change as we all know, perceptions change. Um, so a campaign was launched to change the name. It took them 12 years and only then did the, I'll call them county commissioners of the county, put it to a vote, 170 residents, 100 of them voted for Boondocks Road because Boondocks was a, fa was a very popular catfish restaurant that had burned down on that road 15 years earlier. <laughs> I guess it was still important to the folks of Boondock or of, of that community, uh, but fine, it took 12 years uh, and, a community, and a countywide vote, community vote, uh, to change it uh, in, in only 2004, not that long ago, uh, to Boondocks Road, uh, Texas. And a final quote from Martin Higgins, Marty. Uh, I'm not sure if I could have done what you did, volunteered to fight for a country that took away your rights. In my lifetime, no other group was persecuted as badly as you were. Every one of you deserved the Distinguished Service Award. I, I can't agree more. Uh, I didn't serve in Vietnam when I was growing up. I was a fortunate one with a high lottery number. Uh, but working uh, aboard the USS Midway, for us, Veterans Day is every day. Uh, beyond the 442nd, all of those who serve. So I've developed perhaps an unhealthy appreciation an almost guilt complex uh, for those who have served our country, Begin, again, beginning with, certainly including the 16 million Americans who served in World War II and all those who have served and, and suffered uh, since that time. So it was a real honor to do this research and write this book and hopefully do a little bit to preserve the legacy of Japanese Americans, both at home and abroad. You know, it's their story here in the internment camps and so on, as it was on the ridges of, of the Bosch Mountains and so on, and, and that as well. So thank you for your time. Next, what we really cherish, and that's having the veterans talk about their experience 74 years later. Ed Yoshikawa, down at the end, grew up in Sacramento, California. His family was sent to the Thule Lake Camp where he graduated from high school. After working in Ohio, he attended college in Michigan until he was drafted in 1944. Ed joined Company H of the 442 near the end of the Italian campaign as a replacement. After the war, he graduated from Augsburg and worked for Munsingware. Uh, then after retirement, he started a second nine-year post-retirement career as liaison for uh, textile operations in Japan. Let's see, George Yoshino right here. Grew up Grew up in Bellevue, in a Bellevue, Washington farm family that relocated also to the Thule Lake Camp. After work harvesting crops in Idaho and as a railroad section hand, he volunteered for the MISLS in August 1944 and graduated a year later. George was posted to Manila at the end of the war and then to Tokyo as a translator. After the war, George, uh, George joined his family, who had meanwhile moved to Minnesota. He finished school here, and he worked 40 years as an accountant for an area furniture distributor. And finally, Bill Doy, in the center, <laughs> grew up on a daring and lumbering family in Leland, Washington, that was also relocated to the Thule Lake Camp. Bill was recruited for the MISLS in 1942, volunteered for the program, and studied at Camp Savage, but he was mistakenly diagnosed with TB and spent two months in the Fort Snelling Hospital until they discovered he didn't have TB. They assigned him to general duty. He eventually became the NCOIC of the Office of Special Service. 
Uh, when the school moved to Monterey, Bill re-enlisted in the regular army to continue that work at Monterey. Long career in advertising. And I'm going to be asking them a number of questions, and I may ask specifics, or whoever wants to jump in can jump in. What was I doing when Pearl Harbor was attacked? Well, being uh, farm workers, winter times, we didn't have much to do. But this particular year, uh, I had the opportunity to work for a, uh, a Caucasian man who had a uh, holly, holly farm, that's those prickly leaves, which we are employed to cut the, the branches so they could be uh, made into a, a wreath. Like over here, they use um, evergreen or ever, but on the coast at the beginning, we use holly for a Christmas wreath. That's what happened. And when, the, when we work out in the field, somebody from the, uh, the uh, warehouse came out and said, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Okay. Somebody said, like myself, I said, where's that? <laughs> <coughs> That's about it. We're doing uh, working before Christmas. Well, when uh, the Pearl Harbor attack took place, I was on my way home from church, and my first reaction was, the Japanese are stupid. There is no way can they ever beat the USA. So, and uh, the changes that took place in my life after that is just fantastic. It's unbelievable how the places that I've gone Two, after, as a result of the Pearl Harbor. First of all, we went to Tule Lake, California, which is located in the northern part of Cal California. From there, I went to Cleveland, Ohio, then to Kalamazoo, Michigan, Utah, Florida, France, Italy, back to, back to uh, Cleveland, for my GI Bill of Rights, uh, educational. And then I graduated from Augsburg. And uh, what's so amazing is that I met my wife, Pearl, in, the, in New York City, and we've been together for 64 years. <laughs> what were you doing December 7th? Uh, <clears throat> We were on a farm at that time, and uh, uh, it was a Saturday, a Sunday. A, uh, Talk right into the microphone. Some, some friends were visiting us, and uh, to this day, I can't recall why uh, we did what we did, but about two days before that, uh, this friend of ours was uh, inducted into the army and they had a kind of a going away party for him. And he was taken to Fort Lewis in the uh, state of Washington. Uh, and we decided, for what reason I don't know, that we should go see him. We must have known that we, they wouldn't let us uh, into a fort. Uh, but anyway, we went uh, from where I lived, about 15 miles outside of uh, Seattle, to uh, Fort Lewis, which is just south of Tacoma. And uh, as I said, I don't know why we went there, but we didn't get to see him. December 7th, 1941, I was 14 years of age. I was very aware of what was going on in the world because I kept reading the newspapers and my dad had only recently come back from Japan. Here I am, early morning, like many of the young people at that time, we wanted to go down and see the rest of the gang. And so I was having my breakfast. And what kind of breakfast was that, gang, everybody? Cornflakes, yes. Heard the story before. Exactly so. 
with carnation cream. No such thing as fresh milk in those days in our poor family. I looked out the window, I looked out the screen door, kitchen screen door, looking west towards the Waianae Range. There's a dip there, which is the Kola Kola Pass. And here I see as many as 15 planes coming through and going down into Schofield Barracks. Schofield Barracks is only about three miles, two and a half miles away from my home. We lived up in the Heights area. We could see Schofield Barracks. We could see Wheeler Army Airfield. And as soon as they went down to the Schofield Barracks area, they did not bomb Schofield Barracks. However, they strafed Schofield Barracks, machine gun pallets all over that place. Then they climbed up, and I could see that clearly, about 15 of them in beautiful formation coming down, and as soon as I see that, I see the planes zooming up again and dropping little <coughs> pellet-like objects onto the airfield. The planes going up, all the planes were beautifully arranged. Why? Because they wanted the commanding general wanted to make sure that with last guard in it, and they would away, they would they off Nisei's would be doing sabotage work. As it turned out, all those planes went up because one bullet would go through two planes. I looked up, I hear a sound, I dash outside, and I look up, I see a red ball under the wings, on the fuselage. And as I said, I knew what was going on. I ran into the house, turned on the radio, awakened the rest of the family and said, get up, get up. And radio station KGMB was saying, all servicemen return to your bases. All servicemen return to your bases. The Japanese are attacking us. All servicemen return to your bases right away. This is the real McCoy. I remember that very clearly. <laughs> All right? And that's what happened. That's what I was doing during the first day of battle. Nighttime, we had blackouts. Next, how each of you joined the military and whether you specifically had a choice of where you were going or whether, uh, you know, what got you to MISLS or to 442, uh, why did you join? George, you want to begin to with? We're all draft agents. We had our draft card. Then all of a sudden, after the attack, it was all canceled out. Through negotiation from the uh, American Japanese Citizens League and so on and so forth, which was reinstated, which gave us an opportunity to serve the United States as a citizen. <coughs> so, when this uh, draft thing was all settled and, and reinstated, we had the choice of the uh, military, the regiment, 442, or the language department. The reason I chose the language department, because I told my brother, no use both of us getting knocked off someplace in Europe. <laughs> I said, I have a little more advantage of the Japanese language. So I, that's how I got into the MIS service. Microphone, I know you went into service two years earlier than any of the others did. Why don't you tell us how you joined? Some recruiters uh, from Camp Savage at that time came to Tule Lake to uh, try to get the Nisei to join the MIS. Uh, they wanted desperately to get people who knew even a little bit of Japanese to join. And uh, when the, I say a little bit, that was myself. Uh, I knew very little Japanese, but uh, they gave us a book to study. They gave us uh, a little over a week, and several of us took uh, day and night. We practically memorized that book, and when they came around to test us for uh, whether we were qualified, 
they're very lenient. Uh, just about that anything you said <laughs> could be uh, recognized as perhaps uh, you know not good, but good enough for them. And I passed, and so uh, uh, and there were 35 of us from Tule Lake that uh, were accepted. And uh, there was a, a Sergeant Kumagai who was at Camp Savage at that time came out to bring us to uh, Camp Savage. Well, I uh, graduated from a high school in Tule Lake Camp, and I wanted to further my education, so I went out to Cleveland, Ohio, and worked at a Jewish orphan home for six months, saved enough money, and I enrolled at Western Michigan State in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And uh, just about the end of the first semester, I received uh, a draft notice, and uh, I was to report to Fort Douglas, Utah. In the meantime, while I was going to school, my parents, who were originally in intern in Tule Lake, California, was requested to move to Topaz, Utah. So when I received my draft notice, I went down to Topaz and spent about two months there, and then and I reported to Fort Douglas. And as far as uh, the assignment uh, of duty, I assumed automatically that I would be joining the all Japanese American fighting unit in training and uh, I didn't think of any other serving in any other capacity. So that's where I ended up. What were your <laughs> initial impressions of Minnesota when you arrived here? Oh, how well I remember that. <laughs> uh, we were dressed in California, uh, you know, weight clothes. Uh, that's Tule Lake. And when they came out to get us at uh, the train station in St. Paul, uh, they came with a, a canvas-covered truck, open door and back. I mean, no door and back, just open. And uh, we, with that very little clothes, had to <laughs> sit back there in that open truck all the way to Savage. And when I got to Savage lightly, and I asked him, aren't you cold? And uh, he says, cold? It's not cold. Wait till it gets cold. <laughs> I had no change because the fact that uh, my brother is always here, and he was, uh, he was at the University of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I got here, I just walked over to the university and joined the, uh, and that's where it was. OK. It was easy. <laughs> it was Christmas Day, 1945, that I arrived here from a warm place called Fort McClellan, Alabama, after spending 13 weeks there for my basic training. We did not have any rice down there. <laughs> and as I said, I like sticky rice and as it, so I can have a sushi. Well, as it turned out, we heard about the fact that there is a Hennepin Avenue and on Hennepin Avenue, there would be Chinese restaurants. And of course, Chinese would have rice. And I got on board this, this picture that you saw of the buildings. I got on board the trolley. And the trolley would take me straight down. And as it came to the place where the Seven Corners is, where Seven Corners is, OK? And I saw this great big sign that said, Schlitz beer or something like that. I said, oh, this is pretty good. So I asked the man next to me, I said, on the trolley, is this the main part of town? And he said, yes. I don't know, maybe he misunderstood me. At any rate, <laughs> so I got off. And then it's now five below zero. I remember <laughs> that very, very well. And I looked back, all darkness except for that beer sign. So I walked into the drugstore. I remember Peterson Drugs. And I asked the clerk over there, is this the main part of town? He said, where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to Hennepin Avenue. Well, so just a little walk down there. I said, is it within walking distance? Now some seven corners, 
down Washington Avenue, all the way down, and here I am with my GI, no earmuffs, no gloves, have my hands in my pocket and so on. Now it's seven below with combat boots on, all right? And as when, when came down to lower area where Milwaukee Road's overpasses, where Milwaukee Road now has its uh, skating rink. Okay, another man was coming by. I said, is this the main part of town or where am I going? Where's Hennepin Avenue? And he said, oh, just a block. All right, <laughs> well, it turned out much more. But the idea of it is I did reach Hennepin Avenue despite the cold. I looked up. Hey, I remember all those restaurants to this day. Mun Hing Restaurant, John's Place, Kin Chu, Nanking. Oh, it was heaven. <laughs> all right. We enjoyed the food. Bud, let's, let's get into a little more serious area. Keep the mic there and tell us a little bit about the academics at, at the MISLS. You went there as a student, and I'm sure they put you to work right away in class. Not, not really right away, because as you said, the last graduating class got out, of, got out of here in, what was it, May of 1946, okay? Well, we came in December 25, remember? And we had a few more, and we found out that the group before us started in November, so we missed that class. So we had to go and wait around and did gopher-type work. You go for this, you go for that, you remember? All right. I ended up cleaning up the latrines and so on of the barracks. As it turned out, it worked out fine because when we started, it was March of 1946. And I went all the way over. And in July, we moved the school over to Presidio of Monterey. I remember that. I remember graduating from Presidio of Monterey. It took me nine months. Yes. We did not have any more hey-go. Hey-go means military articles, military uh, vocabulary, military work. It was all, as you said, civil authorities work, okay? And so, and it was in the area of conversation, translation, it was minimal, because those that are good at translation with the key base, they would a assign them that work. We were interpreters, for general interpreting, all right? And as it turned out, we did graduate in December of 1946. And so I remember that we did a lot of work with the Daijiten. The Daijiten is a great big dictionary that we had to use in order to learn kanji. As he said, kanji is very, very difficult. All right, I don't think I could even master a hundred kanji right now. It's tough, it's very tough. And so as it turned out, uh, our training was less strict Less, although Tuesdays and Thursday nights, we did have study hall. We did have two hours of study hall, all right? And I remember there was a man, an, an Issei man, first generation man, who had a little business in Minneapolis making sushi and he making musubi wrapped around in, in uh, nori, you know, the uh, seaweed, okay? With a little pickled plum in the middle, all right? Those of us who, are, who have Japanese ethnicity will, will know this. But as it turns out, they would sell this after the, after the uh, study hall for one dollar a rice ball. I remember buying those and enjoying that for that brief time. But it was, it was an a, a, a enjoyable situation as far as I was concerned. Because I want to say something here. I've said quite a few things, but I want to say something here. I do want to say that we were so royally treated, kindly treated by the Caucasian background of the people here. We were very much in love with Minnesota. That is why I'm still here. We have been very, very nicely treated here. And so I do applaud the Minnesotans and I'm a Minnesotan for over 50 years now. How you ended up in that office and what sort of work your office did. And so they asked me to uh, uh, delay my uh, schooling and start with the next group. Well, the next group went down to uh, Fort uh, Camp Se uh, uh, Shelby uh, to take basic training. I wanted to take basic training. I asked if I could go. 
And they said, no, they would rather have me continue doing what I was doing. So I missed out on that. So I'm probably the only you know, soldier who ever was served time without having basic, without having served KP or <laughs> yard work or anything like that. But <clears throat> I had uh, an interesting uh, uh, you know, time. The purpose of special service was to try to make the free time that the students had uh, it more enjoyable, uh, make them, you know, get out and do things or uh, 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 learn whatever they want, uh, try sports. We had tournaments, uh, leagues, and just about every athletic program you could mention, uh, baseball, uh, boxing, uh, or in boxing, we would uh, have men join uh, Golden Gloves. And at one point, uh, we had uh, a, I don't know, they called it a smoker. I don't know why, what a smoker is, other than we had the smoker at uh, the field house, which is that red building just off of 55 here. And, uh, uh, we uh, about a thousand people, local people, came t to watch it. And the local papers papers picked it up and said that it was probably one of the finest uh, display of uh, sports that uh, they had seen in recently in the local area. The uh, uh, Nisei were just. Uh, didn't have the time to uh, practice uh, and didn't have the facilities to uh, be proficient in uh, uh, boxing to the extent where they could meet with uh, people like Ed Lacey or Del Flanagan, who were local champ champions at that time. Uh, but uh, the, we had uh, people who uh, joined uh, local fencing and uh, badminton classes or uh, competition, and uh, they won uh, the state championships in both of those. We also uh, had uh, uh, the army art uh, art uh, contests, and the winners of uh, each division at the MIS. Uh, that not the, the artists, but their works were sent to Seventh Service Command if we were to compete, and they came away with three ribbons. So uh, uh, we were quite uh, pleased with the success they had. Um, probably, though, the, the most uh, enjoyable from a student standpoint was uh, dances that uh, we were able to put on. Twice a month, uh, we'd have a battalion dance, and we would call uh, people that we knew in Minneapolis and St. Paul, ladies, uh, uh, the YWCA, and they would send out, or we would send in trucks, uh, buses, and hundreds of hostesses would come out and uh, dances would start at 8 o'clock and end around 11. And they were quite uh, well chaperoned. They had order or, or strict rules that if you came out by bus, that uh, you had to go back by bus. <laughs> there was not, <laughs> nothing like going home with a soldier. Uh, in addition to uh, that, we had uh, banking services that uh, uh, people needed when they ha uh, had a school break. People would, uh, the soldiers would get checks from home and uh, no way to cash them. So we made arrangements with uh, First National Bank of Minneapolis. There was a First National at that time. And uh, we would send armed guard 
uh, pick up the official from the bank. Uh, they would come up uh, and uh, uh, they would cash from twenty-five to thirty thousand uh, dollars within one afternoon. Uh, also, the special service uh, uh, so travelers' checks, and up until April of forty-six, we sold one hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars worth of travelers' checks. So we. We were able to help the, the, the soldiers. Uh, and uh, another thing that and, and, and was someone mentioned how wonderful the local people are, uh, I must also emphasize uh, they were, the people were just so wonderful. Uh, they would call uh, our office and uh, Ask, are there any people that uh, you know didn't have any place to go uh, during the breaks? And they said that they would like to invite three or four people over for a home cooked meal for the local people who uh, you know help uh, make life a little bit better for the students. That's a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> right into the microphone, please. <laughs> Even though when we're growing up, we use the Japanese language between the, the parents. The, but when you get to school, you learn different kind of languages. I mean, uh, ordinary language and the military language is altogether different. And to learn all that stuff in, within six months or something, that's impossible. So as for myself, I tried to do the best I can on my own. That's all. <laughs> okay. Tell me also what your initial impression was of the Japanese people when you eventually did go overseas. Oh, I don't know. I, I felt that uh, there was no animosity from the people of Japan to, to occupation forces. And I got along real good. I mean, uh, even the relatives they had nothing against us. So as far as uh, everyday transactions, it was just OK. I had, I had a good time. As I indicated earlier, the 100th was the original draft T group. And they came from Hawaii and trained at Camp Shelby, excuse me, both Camp McCoy and Camp Shelby, Mississippi, Camp, Shelby, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. And then they were sent overseas. And as, as I said, they became a separate infantry battalion with added two companies. Usually, a company would, a battalion would have A, B, C, D. Now they had E and F. All right, and so it was a buttressed, it was a strong battalion. But as I said earlier, by the time they got through fighting up the halfway mark of, of Italy, battles of Cassino, Salerno, and so on, they had lost at least 400 people as casualties, and they needed to have replacements. And as a result, you have the 442 now training in Shelby. And then they were sent overseas, and they were overseas into Italy at Anzio, and beyond that into Civicevecchia, where they first met up with the 100th Infantry. And the 100th Infantry people, as I said, were older. And they would say to their younger people, hey, you crazy or what? You know, this is no game. You can go make. I'm talking in pigeon now. And he's saying, that you can die in this. This is no game, all right? But these guys were ex excellent soldiers all the way, and they went all the way up, and then they were called into the French campaign. The 442, along with the 100th, went all the way up into the area of the Vosges Mountains, and there they had been fighting for several days. They were brought back again for rest. As soon as they brought back for rest, 
Then the commanding general of the 36th Texas Division said, hey, we've got to have you guys get up there again, get up there again. My first battalion of the 141st Regiment is dying without any help, while the second battalion, the third battalion, could not gain any, any respite from the Germans. And so the poor 442, along with the 100th, was sent into the Vosges campaign, and there, in the, in the battle that is known today for the 10 most important battles in the United States history, they were able to rescue, after much fighting, the 1st Battalion of the 141st Regiment, Texas, Texas Regiment. They saved 121 of those lost battalion people. But we lost, the 442 lost, at least 600 casualties to save 121 people. And so no wonder the regiment is declared to be one of the best in the United States Army. And then they were brought back into Italy Italian campaign. And there General Mark Clark sent them against the Gothic line. And they were able to crush the Gothic line by going from the backside of a mountain and going up 3,000 feet and chasing the, the Germans off that mountain. And pretty soon, by April 5, or by, by the May 5, ending pretty much sto stopped. And this was the way of the, of the uh, 442. Let me read you, it is amazing, amazing, what the 442 and 100, 100 Infantry Battalion accomplished. All right, here it is. They got eight major, they participated in eight major campaigns in Europe. We're talking about from a time span of April 43 until the end of the war. Eight presidential unit citations. A unit will be given a citation if they have extremely brave conditions, extremely brave fighting and they would have a streamer be put on their guide on. They receive eight of those, which is unheard of in many units. 18,143 individual decorations, which include, this is, a, this is a regiment now, regimental combat team, not a division, and they receive 21 best that our country can give. 9,486, five French Legion of Honor, 33 DSCs, Distinguished Service Crosses, number two in rank. One Distinguished Service Medal, 28 Oak Leaf Event of Second Silver Star, 22 Legion of Merit Medals, 4,000 Bronze Stars, most of them with the V Medal for Valor involved in it. All right, 15 Soldiers Medals, 12 French Croix de Guerre, two Italian Cross for Military Merit, two Italian medals for military valor. This is the kind of fighting unit that you had within the 442. 100 Battalion became the first battalion because of the tremendous number of casualties going on. What happened was that they took the first battalion of the 442nd Regiment and made that into a replacement training company and from the train battalion. And, and the 1st Battalion was replaced by the 100th Infantry Battalion, but when they fought, started fighting in Italy, the 100th Infantry Battalion, because of their tremendous bravery and the fact that they lost so many people, it was called Purple Heart Battalion, the U.S. Army allowed them to keep, not as a 1st Battalion, 442, but the 100th Battalion, 100th Infantry Battalion, 442nd Regimental Combat Team. This is the kind of talk we're talking about as far as the bravery of these people. And I, I recall as a young man, a senior in high school, going to many of the funerals going on at that time at the Buddhist church. Every Sunday there would be a Buddhist funeral for a boy, a young man killed in the 100th Infantry or 442nd. I recall that very, very much today. I know you had kind of a, a long and strange path uh, getting to the 442, and including Camp Blanding and 
paratroops and German measles? Tell us about that. <laughs> when I reported to Fort Douglas, I, we were shipped out to Camp Landing, Florida for our basic training. And sure enough, when I, when I arrived at Camp Landing, I noticed all the GIs were Niseis. And uh, we were all assigned a tent, a group about uh, five or six to a tent. And they were more or less assigned in, in alphabetical order. And I was placed in a tent with Yoshikawa, Yoshimura, Yoshioka, and a guy named Yamada. <laughs> but this Yamada was different from all the rest of us. He was as Caucasian as anyone can be. He did not have any oriental looks to him. And just because his name was Yamada, he got tossed in with all the other <laughs> Nisei group. Evidently, his father must have been a uh, Issei and a mother a Caucasian. But uh, as, as uh, weeks went by, he, he was just great. We had a fantastic time, <laughs> even with his look. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we went through the basic training and uh, completed the course. And at the end of the session, uh, uh, there was an announcement they made that uh, they were looking for volunteers for paratroopers. So I said, wow, the paratroopers. I was only 19 year old and I said, paratroopers. Boy, they're a good looking outfit. <laughs> and besides, they were getting $50 a month more. So I signed up, and, at the, uh, at, and then there was about three or four or five, or five others that were left behind, and all the rest took off for their two weeks leave before going abroad. And we were left behind, and about three, four days later, I don't know whether the paratroopers were accepting Niseis, for their group or not, but the papers never came through, so they said, well, Ed, might as well take off and go on your leave. And I said, thank God. <laughs> I'm a, I was afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, I went back to, uh, to uh, visit my parents who were family that was in uh, Topaz, Utah, internment camp. And then after two weeks of that, I went, reported to uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, from there we uh, were shipped out. And uh, you want me to continue? Well, were you eager to join your unit on the Italian front? Well, I tell you, before that, we landed in La Havre, France, and then we took a troop train through France, saw the Eiffel Tower through the troop train, and went down to Marseille, France. That was just about uh, uh, the time when, as uh, Butt uh, mentioned, the rescue of the 36th Division, Texas Division, they were just coming down from northern part of France to Marseille. There was a call from, I think it was from General Mark Clark for the Nice troop to help out in the final push in Italy. So that's when I joined up the, with 442 and we were all shipped out to uh, Italy. And, and uh, We were getting, uh, I was getting kind of thing to be called, and there was a announcement made that they needed some replacement for the final push up to Italy. And what had happened is that our unit that went through basic training were 
quarantine with the German miso. <laughs> so they were requesting volunteers to go up as a replacement. And uh, so uh, I had miso when I was a kid. I remember that. So I signed up. And uh, the next morning, I was all packed up and ready to go. However, out of the, all they needed was 120 men. And there were 124 men volunteered. So they needed to eliminate four. And they did not take the one, the alphabetical use, Yoshikawa's in. But there were four from Abe, and, you know. And I was left behind. <laughs> Now, Ed, I, I understand that you had a chance to join the MISLS after VE Day, but for some reason you chose not to come to beautiful Minnesota. Can you tell us why? Well, uh, after the VE, VE Day, uh, there was a recruiter from Fort Snelling uh, recruiting uh, men for the uh, uh, MIS, Military Intelligence Service Language School. And I signed up because my mother was a Japanese school teacher. And I spoke a little bit of Japanese. And I went to school. So I signed up for an appointment. And uh, when that appointment came, I was involved in a poker game. <laughs> And it was a rare, rare occasion I was winning. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> so I just passed up the uh, <laughs> interview, and uh, that's how I missed out on <laughs> <laughs> uh, being with the MIS. <laughs> and as long as you've still got the mic, let's just skip ahead. Why don't you just tell us briefly how you were personally affected by World War II? And then we'll just go down the line with the others. You know, when I was, uh, well, it's a mere fact that I'm here. It's a, it's a fantastic change. I grew up in Sacramento, California, where I read about the Mississippi River, the flood. I mean, I studied about it in school, about the great flooding of the Mississippi River. And here I am in the state of Minnesota, the, where the Mississippi River begins, in Atasca. Anyway, one of the biggest change is that I had the opportunity to meet my wife she was born in Vancouver, Washington. I was born in Sacramento, California. We met in New York <laughs> just before I went overseas. And uh, I just wondered if any of you remember an incident that took place back in 1945 where Empire State Building was hit by a plane Yep. Yep. Well, you got some time old timers here. <laughs> well, I use that as an excuse to begin writing to my wife from Europe. Anyway, that biggest change is that we. <laughs> what can I say? We've been in Minnesota here for the last sixty-four years. So, uh, and I. I can't say, as Bud has mentioned, the people in Minnesota are exceptional. Exceptionally friendly people. I do remember that, uh, well, all I can say, we enjoy living in Minnesota, and I think we'll just end up here. Even though when I told my wife that when I Retired, I'm going back to California where my folks were, Sacramento. But no way, our children are all here in Minnesota, so.
here we are. <laughs> Bill, how were you personally affected by World War II? <laughs> I often wonder what uh, it would be like had uh, it not happened. Uh, I'd never been out of the state of Washington, uh, but I think I knew what I wanted to do because I, would, I had uh, already had a year and a half of art school in uh, Seattle before uh, when we were evacuated. Uh, but uh, then I came to Minneapolis and I, under the GI Bill, uh, went to the Minneapolis College of Arts and Design. Uh, but well, I, I don't know. I often wonder just what uh, uh, changes, wh what would be different, because people didn't move that much before, but certainly <laughs> with the, uh, the war, uh, great changes were made in location. How were you personally affected by World War II? God, I don't know. <laughs> Slightly <little> closer. <clears throat> Actually, of course, uh, you started. After that, you went, everything changed. Coming here in, in Minnesota and, and uh, getting married to a Greek girl, changing the uh, religious from Baptist to Orthodox. I don't know. It's all for the good. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one last question as long as you've got that microphone in front of you. Do you still use your Japanese language skills learned at Fort Snelling? Right now? Sure. No, what's the use of using your Japanese language? You don't need it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know some of the others have. Ed, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say one thing here. You know, the Japanese and the Japanese Americans have gone through much difficulties and suffered a lot of loss and, and struggled and been interned for four years, and that's no fun. But all I can say is that we could be bitter of having suffered all these difficult times but I sincerely can say we are better for having gone through that. And we, as the Lord says, all things work together for good to those who love them. And all the struggles we went through has been a benefit. It's, we really are better for having gone through it. And thank you very much. And Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www dot mn dash ww2 roundtable dot org Production services provided by Barrows Productions. <laughs>